Today we have Sanjay Devgan from, from Columbia Seligman. And um, Sanjay's team runs a mutual fund as well as an actively managed ETF under the symbol uh, SEMI, uh, appropriately named, of course. And today we also have Doug Sandler, who um, is very well known at Riverfront as a global strategist. Uh, thanks, Doug. Um, Sanjay, we'll start with you, if you don't mind. Um, tell us how you got into technology. Yeah. So it's uh, actually, I think it's, it's, it's in my genes. Um, believe it or not, my dad actually worked in the semiconductor industry in the 70s, 80s, 90s. Uh, before he eventually retired, he worked at TI, Fairchild, Varian, a lot of names that we know today. Uh, because of him, we moved to Silicon Valley. So I grew up in Silicon Valley. And, you know, it's, I've always been kind of inundated with it. Um, uh, you know, from personally, from a career perspective, uh, you know, I used to be a process engineer at AMD back in the late 90s. And then uh, I was at Cisco. Uh, 2004, I kind of made the transition to, to Wall Street. Um, and then I've been covering semis since then. So it's, it's kind of, I grew up with it, to tell you the truth. And, and Doug, I'm going to twist a question at you uh, twofold. How did you get into Wall Street? But then also, when did you have the ETF epiphany? Yeah, so, well, well, thanks. My, my, my way into Wall Street is probably unconventional, which is I couldn't find a job anywhere else. And, uh, you know, one thing Wall Street used to do is hire, throw a lot of spaghetti on the wall, and sometimes it sticks. And um, I guess I stuck. So I was an accounting major graduating in 1992, which is right after the 91 recession. And I uh, didn't get an accounting job, which is pretty rare because that tends to be one of those guaranteed jobs at a college and applied to my local brokerage firm, which was in town. It was called Wheat First Butcher Singer, for those of you that, you know, remember kind of the history of that stuff. Uh, and it ended up growing. And, you know, great thing is you kind of go with a company that grows. That means there's more doors opening and closing and there's never enough people to do the work. And I uh, just sort of got sucked into a vacuum of, um, you know, opportunities and was able to do all right in those opportunities. So uh, that's how I got in the business. ETFs to me were, um, you know, we started managing ETF portfolios going back to 2002. Um, just to put that in perspective, there weren't any bond ETFs in 2002, except for a couple of treasury bill ones. So um, we had to do our investing with a mix of ETFs, individual stocks, individual bonds, and closed end funds to cover some areas that we couldn't access. And, um, you know, ETFs were just a superior product. So I can't tell you I'm an ETF evangelist. I'm a great product evangelist. And if ETFs are the thing, you know, that, that, that fit the, or scratched the itches we needed, um, you know, we used them. So we were in a, we ended up running portfolios that had tactical inclinations. And uh, if you're running a 70 stock portfolio, and you want to take five points out to go underweight stock, uh, you either have to decide which positions you want to sell or sell a little bit of everyone. And, you know, if you're an investor, that is a monstrous tax report that comes out. So we used swing positions originally, said we're going to put, you know, X percent of the portfolio in individual names and X percent in swing positions that allow us to get in and out of things quickly. Um, and then the ETF industry evolved to scratch more itches that we had. For example, I don't really want to pick a stock in semiconductors because I don't know a lot about it, but I would love to own the basket of semiconductors. Um, so there was an ETF for that. Um, there's a cap weighted ETF. There was a uh, you know equal weighted ETF, and now there's a you know all sorts of different variations, uh, like the one that uh, Sanjay manages. So we're, so we're, where do you stand in the context of active versus passive, uh, generally speaking? So the view is, um, you know, I think it's an and world, not an or world. So I don't think it's active or passive. I think it's active and passive. So our portfolios are a combination of both. Um, you know, there's times if I just think of a market cycle, right, typically early stages of a bull market, you know, passive tends to work. Um, you know, rising tide lifts all boats. In fact, you know, many times it's the stocks nobody wants to own that do the best in the, in the early stage of a bull market. Um, as the bull market, um, you know, proceeds, uh, um, you know, active strategies tend to do a little better, you know, security selection. And 
as everybody knows, there's bull markets everywhere that they don't always, it's not the big S&P bull market. There may be a bull market in a certain sector like energy, um, but it'll go through that life cycle where the early stage, everything wins, the later stage, you got to be more selective. So uh, I think it's an and world. I think it's a little bit of both. Yeah, I, I tend to believe certain areas require expertise and, and knowledge. And, and particularly, I think, um, in the semiconductor area, right, where, where I, you know, that's, that's a world that's constantly changing. And, and Sanjay's team um, has built a phenomenal track record on the mutual fund. And then they were um, uh, gracious enough to launch an ETF um, as well um, to give everybody the transparency. So Sanjay, let, let, me, let me ask you a question that um, is always at the top of my mind. You know, how do you characterize the broad semiconductor industry? You know, is, yes, there's some cyclicality, but is it really a growth industry? Because I think sometimes people misunderstand yeah. Yeah. the dynamic. So, you, you know, it's interesting. Um, I actually, um, I think the word cyclicality kind of does a disservice to the industry because, you know, if you take the paradigm, when the industry started 50, 60 years ago, there was only one end market that it catered to, and that was aerospace and defense. And then, you know, in the 80s, we had the PC boom. And so the industry, you know, PCs, I think, were like 60 to 70% of the aggregate industry in terms of revenue. And so as the PC industry went, so went the semi industry. And so if you'd wait for an upgrade cycle on the PC side, you have to wait for the upgrade cycle on the semi side. Um, if you fast forward to today, uh, we have so many more end markets than we've ever had. You know, you had the advent of the smartphone, IoT, data center, uh, EVs and autonomous driving. I mean, you're talking about automobiles that had maybe a couple hundred dollars worth of content going to north of a thousand, north of two thousand dollars worth of content. So the end markets are so much more dispersed than what they were in the past. And what that has done is, you know, and I know I'm being kind of a little long winded, but it's, it's reduced the amplitude of the cyclicality. Um, and so that's one thing. It's like, yes, there's a little bit of cyclicality, but you have to be, have to be cognizant of the end markets that each of these guys are levered to. Not everybody's levered to the same end markets. Uh, for example, last year, you know, you had guys in the PC enhanced supply chain, they had negative revisions, but guys in semis that were levered to automotive or industrial, they had no negative revisions. Um, and then just coming back to the growth angle, here's an interesting nugget for you. If you look at the industry, and I'm talking semiconductor devices, cap equipment, and EDA, I kind of lump that as the quote unquote industry. If you look at that, if we go back about 20 years to I think around 2002, we were about three tenths of a percent of worldwide GDP. That was the industry in aggregate. Today, we're about eight tenths of a percent. So in those 20 years, we've basically tripled relative to the rest of the GDP in the world. You know, and I mean, I think we're still going to grow because you're finding more and more use cases for semiconductors. Um, you know, the, the, basically it's the electrification of the world. And so, you know, it's a long winded way of saying, I think the industry is a growth cyclical industry, meaning it's a growth industry. Yes, you have to be cognizant of the cyclicality within the various end markets, but that cyclicality is way muted relative to what it's been in the past. And, and Doug, you, highlighted in one of your pieces, um, the semiconductor industry in January. Um, you know, what what made you think about the industry specifically? Uh, the, I think that on that piece, we were talking about the overall economy and that, um, you know, um, the reshoring opportunity that was going on uh, in the US, um, you know, obviously, um, U.S. relationships with with China uh, have been contentious. Um, you know, Taiwan is a giant semiconductor uh, manufacturer. I think they do about you know fifty five percent or something like that of of U.S. or of the semiconductors in the world. Seventy five percent of semiconductors are produced out of Asia. So, um, you know, I think the bloom has come off the rose when it comes to outsourcing all of semiconductor manufacturing um, for lots of reasons. I mean, one is you know you know our friends are becoming our foes in some places in Taiwan. Uh, if you ask China, is part of China, right? Um, you know, there's, they make no bones about it. That is part of uh, their country. So if we're going into a cold war with China, which it seems to be the case, you know, you have to be very wary of, um, you know, 
pitching too much of your supply chain uh, to, to, to Taiwan. Um, so that's one issue. Second issue is obviously the trade tariff uh, wars that have been going on, starting under the Trump administration, continuing through the Biden administration, that that's a difficult thing if you're, you know, outsourced your supply chain. And then third, the COVID issues, obviously, you know, with the zero tolerance COVID, which is what China had for a while, uh, that really hampered supply chains. And, you know, you don't believe me, just go out there and try to buy uh, something that needs a lot of semiconductors, whether it's a new car or some of the latest smart appliances, and you're going to be in a backlog. Um, you know, we've have too much relying on that. So the piece I'd written had a lot to do with, um, you know, we are reshoring semiconductor plants, probably more of them being built in the U.S. than any time I can remember. Uh, and that's a good thing for lots of reasons. One is you're bringing, you know, high paying jobs back to the U.S. Two is you're making for a far more res uh, resilient supply chain. Um, and ultimately, I think that's, you know, going to be good for our country. Sanjay, can you expand on that? Because I, I think there's a lot of headlines about it. But you also have the ability to pivot around your names to take advantage of it. Yeah, no, I mean, absolutely. I think, uh, you know, to echo um, Doug's point, you know, basically the whole reshoring process that's been taking place, it's it's led to a number of, I guess you can kind of call, it, call it, quote unquote winners versus losers, so to speak. From a foundry perspective, I think it's very exciting. You know, um, global foundries, they used to be advanced micro devices fabs. They spun them out, I think, in the 2008, 2009 timeframe. It languished for almost 10 years. Uh, and then Tom Caulfield, the CEO, he kind of made the pivoted uh, strategy and said, we are going to focus on kind of 12 nanometers and above. We don't have the CapEx wherewithal to kind of play that bleeding edge game. And they've done phenomenally well because a lot of American companies, their, their customers, you know, silicon suppliers that foundered with guys like UMC and SMIC and TSMC in China and Taiwan, they're being forced to pull their business back to the US or either not necessarily the US, but to Europe or Singapore or upstate New York, that which is where Global Foundries has their fats. You know, they want geographic diversification. They don't want to be kind of tethered to the turmoil and the tumult that's taking place in, in the Taiwan China region. And so you have seen winners from that perspective. I would just add, you know, in order to really bring the onshoring back, it's not just the fabs, it's also the, um, the uh, OSATs or the, uh, you know, um, the package assembly guys. It's, it's not as uh, high value as kind of the, fa you know, the foundry, but you still need that and you need to onshore that. There's also been discussion about bringing that to Mexico, you know, in Mexicali, I know a couple of companies have package assembly test facilities there. Uh, so folks are talking about that's kind of the next step. You know, we bring the fabs back to North America or Europe, but you also need package assembly test and, and kind of, you know, that's the next step. And that's, like I said, it's not as high value add, but it's definitely needed because you need the entire supply chain. So have you repositioned your portfolios in 2022 into 2023 to take advantage of some of the spending change that you, you were expecting? I mean, yes, absolutely. You know, I mean, we we definitely, um, but you can do it to an extent, let's put it this way. Um, you know, so obviously we, you know, we own Global Foundries. We've liked it. It's been a, it's been a great um, uh, performer and continue to believe in it. The problem is um, for leading edge, capacity, you need TSMC. And TSMC is located in Taiwan. So any company, whether it's NVIDIA, Broadcom, Marvell, Qualcomm, you name it, they are using TSMC today. So the question is, if something happens, uh, i.e. there's an invasion of Taiwan, there's not a lot you can do because not only does it affect semis directly, but it's going to affect the entire economy, you know, because if you don't have semiconductors, you can't ship cars. We've seen what it's done with all the auto OEMs, you know, uh, complaining about semi capacity and the chips that led to the chips act, et cetera. So yes, you can mitigate to an extent, but really if, if that happens, it, it's much, it's, it goes much beyond semiconductors. It, it's, a, it's a big deal beyond semiconductors because now you potentially have kind of China controlling the United States GDP and that, you know, so much of our GDP is underpinned by semiconductors and it comes out of Taiwan. So I would say the need is to, you know, it's good that Taiwan TSMC is bringing fabs and they're building fabs in Arizona, 
to the extent that we can kind of hasten that and bring that on shore, you, you, you need self-sufficiency, you know, and, and I think that's, that's a very important thing. So, so Doug, when you're looking at the semiconductor industry, I think what you were saying was that there is some cyclicality in your mind to the business, but it's really a growth allocation. You know, um, talk to us a little bit about how you view it as a growth opportunity, and 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 the various themes that might filter through it. Yeah, I mean, I think. So there's my, my opinion on it, and then there's what the market tells me. And when I look at the valuation of semiconductors on, you know, how they trade on a price to sales basis, which is often how I'd look at a cyclical industry, they are worlds apart from where the traditional cyclicals trade, you know, most of them being under one-time sales. Um, so market views them as a growth industry, whether they, you know, have some cyclical tendencies, it's not what the market, the way the market's viewing it. Um, you know, the growth stuff, like like San, Sanjay said, is, you know, things get smarter. And, you know, as things get smarter, whether it's, you know, smart things like computers or smartphones or, you know, vehicles or dumb things like the RFID stickers that go on, you know, more and more things, all that stuff, you know, has integrated circuits in it. And, you know, we know this is very cliche, but the world's, you know, things are getting smarter. That's the internet of things or, um, you know, that uh, Sanjay mentioned earlier. Um, so there's lots of growth tailwinds and they only, it's almost like the network effect, right? The more things get smart, the more we need more smart things, right? Because everything becomes interconnected. So I think you're going to see demand for semiconductors, you know, is not going to ebb. It's just going to continue to grow and we're going to continue to find you know, more places to put it. That used to be the uh, the way PCs worked, right? Is that, you know, semiconductors would have a big advance um, and software would have a bigger advance. And then you need a bigger advance in semiconductors to keep up with the software. It's sort of the same thing, right? That, you know, semiconductors get to a certain point, we just develop all new sorts of, you know, uses for them. And then you got to make the chips faster and faster and use more and more of them. So I think there's a ton of tailwind to this industry. Um, and uh, yeah, I would put it in the growth space. By that notion, I would say that it's going to, you know, live and die a little bit on, you know, if investors are embracing growth. And certainly in the last six months, that's not been, you know, what investors have been embracing. They've been looking for, um, you know, more about companies that deliver today than companies that deliver tomorrow. And it's a theme that, you know, goes in and out of favor. But right now, I think for the foreseeable future, investors are favoring those companies that whose earnings and cash flow uh, materialize right now. So if I looked at how we're positioned towards tech in general, it's going to be the big old boring stuff, right? The, the, the companies that have had lots of time to, you know, build their business and build the economic moats around their business and now are just cash flow machines. And, you know, there are companies in software and semiconductors that, you know, fit that criteria. Well, but, you know, the problem, frankly, with some of that, and you take Intel as an example, and um, great yielding stock, right? But, you know, are they going to capture the innovation that um, I think needs to happen um, to survive? So, Sanjay, what are, what are your thoughts, not specifically maybe on Intel, but who are the innovators in, in the space? Yeah, no, I, I mean, what I love about semiconductors is they touch all end markets. And so wherever there's innovation going on, it doesn't move forward without semis. Um, you know, so if you look at semiconductors, some of the things I get most excited about are, are obviously AI, um, data center, interconnect, uh, EVs, or, or I should just say the electrification of cars, whether it be autonomous or semi-autonomous and EVs. And, and, you know, the, the names that kind of dovetail off that, obviously, you know, clearly NVIDIA is, uh, they're well known, um, you know, they reported last night and they're kind of the leader in the AI space. But a name that I think doesn't get enough play because they've done a lot of acquisitions and they've, they've, they're not 100% a semi company um, is Broadcom. You know, people don't realize in the space of AI, I think Broadcom is the second biggest um, uh, company by, by sales. Um, Google's TPU 
uh, their in-house custom ASICs, you know, their Google chips. Those are Broadcom ASICs. I mean, Google licenses all the, you know, the, the, the Surtees blocks, the, the critical IP, and Broadcom basically lays it out and gets it manufactured for Google, and they get their margins on that. And so they've done, I think, six generations of the Google TPU. That business is north of a billion dollars a year. I mean, so from a scale perspective, Broadcom is probably the second biggest guy. Nobody talks about it. The other big thing is when you're talking about AI, you need interconnect because you have a compute node with an NVIDIA GPU, but the compute node is useless if you have latency between nodes. And that interconnect comes from the form of Ethernet, you know, Ethernet switching. Broadcom is the 800 pound gorilla there. They have over 90% share in the switching market. You know, so I think that's kind of an underappreciated story just because Broadcom has so many other businesses. And so, you know, obviously clearly AI. Uh, when you're talking automotive, um, there are a number of semiconductor companies that are doing extremely well tied to the automotive theme. Uh, you know, like I talked about earlier, the fact that we're going from kind of a couple hundred dollars in ASP per car to north of a thousand dollars. You know, guys like On Semi, um, guys like Microchip, guys like ADI. Uh, there's a small company in Southern California that went public a couple of years ago, Indie Semi. Um, they're a pure play on auto. Love them a lot. You know, so these are names that I like kind of in the in in the uh, auto space. Um, and so I think these are all, they're all innovators. I mean, like I said, the world doesn't move forward without semiconductors. And so it's hard to kind of say like one guy is doing more innovation than the other. But I kind of look at the innovation within the end markets. And those are kind of some of the names that I like in terms of, you know, what's going on uh, around those end markets and what's kind of driving innovation. And, but I think your portfolio tilts to the U.S., right? So is this also a, you know, really a good statement about how the U.S. actually may end up being a leader in the space? Yeah, I, I mean, yeah. So if you look at uh, most of the IC companies, uh, our names are definitely U.S. centric. I think it's it's uh, there are names internationally that we own. But I think if you look at kind of the margin profile that I'm looking for, uh, the the stickiness, you know, uh, so it, it depends on end market. If you're kind of kind of going downstream, if you're willing to give up margin and get business, there are a lot of names outside of the U.S. that you can kind of play. The problem is, as an investor, I'm kind of looking for sticky cash flow, and I use margins as a proxy for how sticky your cash flow is. Mm -hmm. And so I tend to get higher margin uh, multiples with kind of companies that are levered to automotive to data center, AI, you know, and so that's, it's kind of naturally gravitates me back here because, you know, I, I feel a comfort put assigning a multiple to um, higher margin companies because I just feel that that's, you know, kind of indicative of the, the sustainability of the cash flow. So, so Doug, you speak to financial advisors all the time. Um, you know, we do that as well in the ETF think tank, of course. And, and we're hearing a lot of questions around the semiconductor space, I mean, positive questions. Are, are you hearing the same, that people are intrigued about, you know, all this future spending here in the U.S.? Yeah, I, mean, I, I am. I'm maybe not as much as you are. I think the CHIPS Act, which came out in the summer, um, you know, that was a big um, um you know, certainly got a lot of fanfare was, you know, we're going to reinvest in our semiconductor industry in the U.S. We made 40% of the world's semiconductors in 1990. Today we make 10 or something like that. Um, so I think that got a lot of headlines. Um, certainly kind of the sell-off in technology that's happened in the last, you know, 12 months makes a lot of these things, you know, more attractive. So get the questions, uh, certainly. Um so yeah, yeah, I think I think uh, what you're hearing is reflective of what we're hearing from advisors. Yeah, yeah. Um, along, along the same lines, Doug. I mean, um, what is your view, by the way, on equities, particularly in the year 2023? So overall, I'm, we're expecting kind of a you know I'd say three things. Number one is we're expecting this to kind of be a lukewarm year, so mid single digit returns high single digit returns. So if you've watched the S&P lately, we started the week, I think up, up six and a half percent for the year. So you might say a lot of the returns from a pure participation standpoint, just being in the market, you know, a lot of those have already been delivered. Now, if we flip the coin, I'd say there's more risk that we are too conservative and things are better 
than we expect than being too um, too optimistic. So you do have that chance that you know inflation gets under control, the economy keeps growing, and we get a 15% type year on the S&P. But even if we do get single digits, I think we've evolved into a market that's going to be, you know, point number two, that's going to be more selective, right? That you're not going to make all your money by just being in, right? That was the game that worked when, you know, the Fed was flooding the system with money and, you know, with really low rates, you know, that creates that rising tide that lifts all boats. We're no longer in that world, right? You got to be more selective. So I think you can take a, you know, five, six, seven, eight percent return in the market and turn it into a, you know, twice that with 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 some selection. Um, the last point would be that, you know, how do we select? We're really focused on a theme which we call PATTY, P-A-T-T-Y. And, you know, we made it up, but it stands for pay attention to the yield. And we chose a woman's name because the last theme was Tina, which was there is no alternative to equities, if you remember. Um, so where it's no longer a Tina market, there's lots of alternatives to equities and the way you differentiate them is paying attention to the yield. And by that, I mean, companies that pay you today, not always in dividends, sometimes it's earnings, sometimes it's cash flow, sometimes it's in bond coupon, right? But companies that deliver today are going to be what investors favor in a world that seems pretty hazy when you look out on the horizon. It's an interesting point. You know, when I when I think about um, the semiconductor industry, Sanjay, one of the things that you have to be cognizant of is, you know, it can be a capital intensive business, right? Parts of it, for right. sure, right? Um, you know, what are your thoughts on on that? Then also, uh, what are your thoughts about any any reason to think that there might be some consolidation in the space? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I'll, maybe I'll take the second question first. Um, you know, part of the reason why we, um, you know, if you look at the, the ETF that we had launched in, in semiconductors, it was kind of to capture that alpha from the consolidation that had been taking place. Um, if you look back over the last 10 years, we've probably seen 100 different M&A announcements. It was long overdue. I would argue we still need more consolidation because how many industries have you know, 50 or 60 companies. You know, you don't see many industries where you have that many players. The problem right now is because of the political bifurcation between the US and China, it's difficult to get approvals from China because a lot of companies have revenue exposure there and you have to get uh, approval through the Chinese government. And, and you know, you saw the NXP Qualcomm deal was torpedoed because of China. Uh, they were dragging their feet. And so, so I definitely think there should be more M&A. Um, uh, you know, and then, sorry, remind me on the first part of the question. You know, interest rates have gone higher, right? The, yep. the business itself oh, the um, is is capital intensive, but most, most of the companies have very solid balance sheets too. Yeah, yeah. So you are going to see more CapEx. And I remember within the semi-industry, there are different segments. You have the IDMs, the guys that vertically integrate and have their own fabs. You have the, the completely fabless guys, and then you have the foundries, the guys that just make chips for others. Um, the fabless guys, the CapEx intensity is, is not really a, uh, it's not really part of the equation. You know, so guys like uh, Marvell, Broadcom, NVIDIA, these guys don't have to worry about large CapEx outlays. The, the guys, I would say kind of the, you know, the interesting guys in my perspective are the analog guys, because historically the analog companies, you know, they've had a great business model in that um, uh, they would buy fully depreciated equipment from the digital guys. The digital guys that need leading edge process technology, they use their tools for a few years and then they sell fully depreciated tools to the analog guys because the analog guys are, you know, leading edge guy might be at seven nanometer and analog guys at 45 or 55. And because of device physics, you can't shrink the transistor in analog as quickly as you can in digital. So they can use these fully depreciated tools. What's happening is the gap has expanded so much, even the analog guys can't use these leading edge tools. They have to buy brand new tools. And so it's created an interesting paradigm because yes, their CapEx is going up, but you're actually seeing a change in the industry. I mean, semiconductors have been a deflation, in, you know, that time period, I give you that stat where we went from three tenths of a percent of GDP to eight tenths of a percent over 20 years. During that time, I would say three quarters of that time, we were a deflationary industry, meaning every year for the same component, I give you a three to 5% price break. That's no longer happening. And that's kind of what drove the growth in the industry last year, because I have to buy these new tools and they're not fully depreciated. I need to get a return on those tools. And because of that, I'm passing those costs on. And that's why you've seen everybody talk about 
uh, you know, pricing pressures coming from the semiconductor industry. You know, TSMC, the largest foundry in the world, they said they were going to institute a three to six percent price increase for 2023, three percent for the digital guys, six percent for the analog customers. And so, so I guess my point is that actually accelerates the growth of the industry because these guys want to maintain their margins. If you're a 60 percent gross margin com company, you are going to price higher to maintain your 60 percent, and that's exactly what we saw from guys like ADI and Microchip, et cetera, et cetera. And so. That's the paradigm that's been going on. I mean, that's the most interesting part is this analog space. On the on the foundry side, yes, guys like Global Foundry, et cetera, it's even more cost prohibitive for them because they have to build more tools. But the way it is today, you know, they're putting in these things called LTAs or long-term agreements. They're basically getting customers to say, okay, Ford or GM, there was a there was a deal that Global Foundries just announced with GM last week, whereby GM secured a quarter of capacity with Global Foundries. They paid them north of $2 billion to secure future capacity for their semiconductor customers so that if there's ever tightness, they would have the opportunity to use that capacity so GM isn't sitting idle in their plants. You know, and so you're getting kind of these long-term assurances that you didn't have before because it's so cost prohibitive to build a fab. And that's kind of the interesting change that's shifted. And that's why going back to, we were talking about that growth versus cyclicality, right? Um, yes. The cyclicality came because you'd have too much capacity and then, you know, it's boom, bust, boom, bust. But they're trying to mitigate that cyclicality by getting these quote unquote LTAs from their customers so that, okay, if you, if you, if you want this capacity, we'll build this fab, but you have to assure that you're going to fill it up. Otherwise we get to keep your money, you know? And so that's the interesting thing that's changed. And uh, I mean, it, it just blows my mind relative to where the industry was 15 years ago. You know, that's something that I don't think everybody understands. In order, in, in order to, to uh, um, have a spot, a lot of companies have to put down massive deposits to keep their slot, right? And, and so while the industry may be capital intensive, it, it's subsidized by the, by the customers in certain, in certain areas, right? They're starting to, they're starting to. I mean, and that's the, that's the interesting paradigm. A lot of people don't believe it because they say, well, if, if the macro goes in the tank and nobody needs, are you going to force your customers to take this? You know, and, and of course you can't, I mean, you can, cause you have contracts and you can force them to, but the better alternative is to say, Hey, look, okay, why don't we extend the terms of the contract? Um, you've paid us a prepayment. We'll, we'll take that to kind of offset this gross margin hit and then give us the next generation in our fact. You know I mean? So there are ways to mitigate it. So it's, but it's not a complete, like I'm left holding the bag. You know, I put all this CapEx into the ground and you promised me you were going to give me orders and oh, lo and behold, the macro went in the tank and now I have no orders and I have a, you know, a fab that's running underutilized. You know what I mean? So my margins are going to get trapped. No, they're, they're kind of forcing the customers and it forces them to be kind of more diligent with respect to their forecasting. You're, you're not just going to give a pie in the sky forecast if you know you're going to be held to it. Yeah. Doug, coming back to you, uh, um, these days, a lot of conversations with financial advisors also, uh, you know, uh, deals with inflation, right? You know, how are you answering the question? I know this isn't about semiconductors, but, yeah. you know, how are you answering the question around inflation these days and, and you know, A, how to manage it and how you're seeing it filter through different um, uh, industries and different portfolios. Yeah, uh, it's interesting. The inflation question is very interesting because, you know, I look at it from perspective of, you know, I talk about automotive, uh, you know, and, and, and it's a really interesting piece there because you're definitely seeing inflationary price pressure for, for semiconductor components. Something that costs maybe $2 in the past is now $5 or $10, you know, I'm just making up numbers. But think about it in the context of a, $30,000 car. If I'm an auto OEM and I have a component that went up, let's say doubled in cost from $2 to $4, am I going to quibble because it's going to stop my $30,000 car from shipping? You know, and I mean, so in the automotive end market, the semi guys, they're able to pass on those inflationary costs. You know, it's, it's very, where I would kind of argue where you have to be cognizant is kind of more the high volume, low margin, kind of like handsets. You know, that's where it's very cutthroat because the design cycle is year to year. Uh, you know, you have a new iPhone every year and Apple is going to be very onerous in terms of the pricing they get from their customers. So there's less ability to kind of push back on the pricing, you know, as you have, but, but yes, from an inflationary standpoint, I mean, thankfully it seems like the industry has been able to pass on the costs. 
And it's the example of the, the auto example, you know, it's kind of like, an, or even in a hyperscale, let's, let's put it this way, like Google or, or Facebook, they don't look at, you know, if I buy an ASIC from a Broadcom or a Marvell, I'm, it's, it's a CapEx for them, but it lowers the cost per bit to process, it, it lowers the processing cost per bit because every time I have a query at Google, right, it costs me money to process that query. If I have interconnect that's more efficient, it lowers the cost per bit to process, right? So it's an efficiency tool from their perspective. So even though you're getting inflationary pressures, you're still staying ahead of the, the uh, you know, it's still providing utility in terms of lowering the cost per bit, you know? And so that's kind of how the semi guys have been able to pass these, these, these um, costs on, you know, they're, they're efficiency tools. So let's put it that way. They, they drive efficiency in terms of lower power cost, uh, heat dissipation, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, that's, that's kind of, you know, semis what they've done. And I think that's what they'll continue to do. Doug, uh, take a crack at that, that, that question sure. as well on inflation. Sure. So there's going to be definitely industries that, you know, have inflation. Um, but I think by and large, I like to look at sort of the broad economy. And I think uh, the inflation um, struggles we faced in the last, you know, year and a half are definitely abating. Um, and I think most of them were caused by the shutdown of the supply chain. Uh, I'm not in the camp that it was all created by too much money because the money printing, if you look at it, was almost entirely offset by declining money velocity uh, in our economy. So um, like anything, you shut something down for a while and it's hard to get it restarted. And I just use the analogy of, you know, take your lawnmower, you put it away in November, you get take it out in May and you try to get it restarted, it's probably not going to start. Um, and the supply chain is a very complicated engine. And if you idle it, and try to restart it, uh, particularly under load, which is what we tried to do with our supply chain, you're gonna run into all sorts of problems. Um, and it's gonna take time to get it fixed, but it always gets fixed. And I think at this point, what you start, you're, what you're seeing is, you know, the supply chain in the US has largely been fixed, particularly in the goods channel, you know, goods being like tables and chairs and those sorts of things. I look at order backlogs, they're not there, right? The order backlogs are back to where they were you know, pre-COVID, um, you know, global shipping costs are back to where they were pre-COVID. And if I look at inventory levels at most uh, most retail, um, they're too much inventory. Um, so I think that kind of uh, supply or that kind of inflation is pretty much licked and it's gonna, and you can see it in the inflation figures coming down. Services supply chain, um, that's probably still got some issues there. Um, I think it's tough to get workers back, particularly if an industry has been shut down for a long period of time. Uh, if you're a bartender and your restaurant you work at closes for two years, you ain't a bartender anymore, right? You've moved on to do something else. And when the restaurant reopens, you're not there, you know, to, you know, to um, start working again. Um, I found that largely to be a little bit of a red state, blue state thing. If you go to the states that did not shut down their uh, service industry for a very long period of time. Most of them are running 80, 90% of where they were pre-COVID. I go to some of the bluer states where things were shut down for a lot longer, you may see sort of 60% uh, of where they were pre-COVID. So the good news is it works itself out eventually, but um, you know some states are further behind than others. So I think inflation is getting better. I think it's... Uh, not quite yesterday's story because um, it's going to take some time and I don't think we're ever getting back to the one to two percent because reshoring costs more um, you know I think there's you know there is some you know changes we're going to go back to sort of the three to four percent inflation environment so I think it's getting better I think the Fed can start taking their foot off the brake here soon um, but it's not going to get as good as it was for the last you know decade or so you know, um, too often we forget that inflation has an impact on human capital as well. And everybody tends to want to get paid more as a result of, of inflation. Um, and, 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 and that's just the reality, right? Um, and we're in the asset management business, right? So our, our, all of our costs are increasing, which can make it difficult to keep people and retain them. So you're both in the asset management business. Um, you know, maybe this is a little bit off subject, but I'd be curious to know, and I'm going to start with Sanjay with this, because um, 
yours is a team that's been together for decades, right? You know, yep. talk to yep. us a little bit, not so much about inflation, about the team and how the team works together. You know, do you visit companies still? Um, you know, how do the conversations go? And, and, and really, how long have you guys been together? It's amazing. Yeah, yeah. So I've uh, it's been a little over 10 years for me on the team. I joined in 2012. Uh, Paul Wick, who is the head guy on our uh, technology and infrastructure flagship mutual fund, he's been running it since 1990. Um, and so, so uh, you know, he's kind of the guy who's, who's driven it. There are 10 of us on the team. Um, there are two of us that kind of cover semi and semi cap, myself and my colleague, Shekhar. We're the two semi guys and um, you know, but we basically have kind of experts in software, internet, um, hardware, fintech. I mean, you name it kind of across the tech supply chain. That's kind of our our MO. And then, you know, we decided to take the semiconductor track record out of the mutual fund. And that's how we kind of launched the, uh, the semi ETF a, a while ago. And so, um, you know, in terms of company visits, I will tell you, I, I love to visit companies. Uh, COVID was painful. I, I just got tired of Zooms. I, I'm a personal believer in kind of building relationships. And I think it's it's always better to do it in person. Um, you know, I, I always tell people, I, sometimes I feel like I learn more from a company, the five minutes walking from the conference room to the elevator. You know, you're kind of talking about the weekend and your kids, et cetera, but you just kind of pick up little things. And I, I I think that's invaluable, you know? And so, yes, I, I try to visit as many companies as I can. And luckily being here in Menlo Park, California, it makes it easy. I don't have to get on a plane as often because uh, a lot of them are in driving distance. So it makes it uh, uh, very doable. And Doug, you know, I, I, I know we're winding down here. Uh, talk to us a little bit about your team too and, and how long you guys have been together because it's been a long time too. Yeah, we have been. I would say inflation, uh in our industry i haven't seen it i think we've gone through deflation for the last few years i mean you remember dan i mean you had institutional salespeople, traders wholesalers making you know sometimes you know uh, seven figures and that is non-existent today and if it is it's going away you know it's being attacked on all sides sanjay you probably remember back in the day 20 years ago when the analyst was a god, right? Um, you know, companies would pay just about anything for, for a great analyst. That business has changed. I think as fees have come down, um, you know, we're maybe one of the few industries that really have not seen um, a whole lot of uh, wage inflation. But, you know, despite that, I mean, I think in the last year, we probably have seen a little bit, um, but I think it's about creating something that's more than just the comp. Right. I mean, you can always hire mercenaries, right? Just pay them more. And there's always people willing to jump around for a paycheck. But the type of team we try to build is, you know, a team that is here for more than just that. So I would say number one, being in Richmond, Virginia, is we're not attracting people that jump around a lot because there's only a couple of firms here in Richmond where you can jump around to before you've gone through that, uh, you know, you know, gone through that pond. Um, but we're a uh, we're a employee owned company, so every employee has the opportunity to own stock. Uh, culture to us is a really big thing. Um, so, you know, if 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 we can pay in the same world as most people, and add to that, you live in a city that, you know, maybe, you know, a little bit more affordable. Um, you work with colleagues that you like to like to hang out with and have been there for a while, and you have a uh, ownership stake in the company. You know, that's enough uh, oftentimes to keep a team together. And we've been pretty good with our investment team where, you know, very little turnover there. And we always like to give back on these calls and, and ask um, uh, the advisor or in your case, um, you, you know, about a charity that, that you um, support. So talk to us a little bit about um, your charity. Yeah, for uh, Riverfront, we partner with a uh, local business uh, or local charity every year. Uh, this way, this year, we partner with a company called The Doorways. Uh, the Doorways basically provides a lot of the things you would need if your son or daughter was put in the hospital for an extended period of time. Um, you know, what would you do if you had to live out of suitcase for two months? Well, you'd probably need a whole bunch of stuff that is back in your house and you're not going to be able to get. So they provide those sorts of necessities 
for families that have been uh, upended because of an illness, um, you know, extended illness in, in their family. So it's called the Doorways. It's in uh, Richmond, Virginia. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to talk about it. And it's in the chat, okay. Um, gentlemen, thanks very much for being here today. Definitely enjoyed the conversation. Columbia Threadneedle, thank you for sponsoring the discussion. And Doug, um, thank you for your time and, and being a participant here. Happy to do it. Learned a lot from San Sanjay as well. Thank you for, for, uh, yeah, for that. I love, love these kind of think tanks. Thank you so much. Really appreciate the time. Thank you. Have everyone. a great day, everybody. And, and for everybody who is part of the audience, thank you for your participation. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah.